Okay, welcome to our next segment. Um, we'll be discussing an offshoot of the High Renaissance called Mannerism. Um, after Michelangelo and Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci and these sort of superstar artists from the High Renaissance, um, art was sort of at an impasse. Um, all the problems of representing reality had been solved and art had reached a peak of perfection and harmony. So what were artists supposed to do now? The answer replaced harmony with dissonance, reason with emotion, and reality with imagination. In an effort to be original, late Renaissance or man mannerist, um, artists abandoned realism based on observation of nature. So, so this is a huge shift from, from what we've seen with high Renaissance art. Um, just to give you some contextual history, um, the time period really during the late Renaissance or, or Mannerist period really did favor this sort of disorder and sort of reflected um, what was happening um, in Rome. Um, Rome had been sacked by the Germans and, and Spaniards and the church had um, lost its authority during the Reformation. Um, so to contrast during the high Renaissance before times were more stable. So we see that pictures and we talked about some of these stylistic conventions, conventions, the compositions were symmetrical, balanced, um, weighted toward the center. Um, in the late Renaissance compositions were, um, become very oblique. Um, there's often a void in the center, and figures are often um, crowded around and sometimes cut off by the edge of the frame. And um, it's, it looks very chaotic. There's a loss of um, this sort of unifying faith. Um, you know, in a metaphorical sense, the center cannot hold. This was a quote by um, W.B. Yeats, Yeats um, later said. And paintings were made off-balanced. Um, as opposed to balance, and we'll look at some of those um, stylistic features. So we're going to be looking at this particular painting. Um, it's entitled um, The Deposition from the Cross. It's an altarpiece. Um, remember, the deposition is the um, removal of the Christ um, from, from the cross, the, the dead Christ. And this was done by an Italian um, Renaissance painter, um, Pontormo, and he completed it in 1528, and it is considered one of, really to be one of his um, surviving masterpieces. It's painted in oil paint, and it's on wood panel, and um, it's located above the altar of the Campani Chapel of the Church of Santa Felicita in Florence, and here's a better view of it. So again, manners is, mannerism is an offshoot of central Italian art in the High Renaissance, and this is where younger artists depart from the great masters, um, such as Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael, creating an art style that exaggerated aspects of these great Renaissance artists. So they're sort of trying to move away and sort of separate themselves um, from these artists. Um, characteristics include um, there's often very erotic um, sort of um, a subject matter. Um, it's usually intended for um, an educated um, court audience. And figures um, are sort of serpentine-like. And there's a term called figura, figura serpentinata. Um, and this is one of your vocabulary terms. And the space is very irrational and compressed. And so when we look at Pontormo's um, deposition, we see it, he's depicting Christ getting ready to be placed into his tomb. So he's been removed from the cross. And really note how strange the figures look. They're very elongated, and the space is very compressed. So it's very different from the high Renaissance, um, very balanced compositions that we saw before. Also, the color palette has changed a little bit. Um, there's this, these use of pastel colors like pink and blue, um, which is a characteristic of late Renaissance or Mannerist style. So here's a comparison um, to Pontormo's, and then on the right over here is um, 
the same subject, the deposition done by Raphael, who hopefully you remember was one of the um, great high Renaissance artists. Um, when we look at Raphael's version, we see a landscape with three crosses. In Patormos, the space is very ambiguous and the landscape is removed from any historical setting. So those are some differences. In Raphael's version, um, the figure of Christ is more centralized, where Patormos, the figure is more off-centered. Um, and so it has that sort of asymmetrical balance where this is definitely more symmetrical and balanced both vertically and horizontally. Um, like many of the high Renaissance composition paint, um, compositions were. We'll look at some details. Um, the figure of Christ, when we look at um, him, and this is, this is the figure of Christ over here, he really is clearly dead, and, and we really get a sense um, of the dead weight of the figure um, and the way um, Pontormo has really communicated that um, idea. And again, note the elaborate poses of the figures. Um, they're very unusual and, and really not something that people would do in real life. Um, and this is a way for Pontormo to show off his skill and that he is technically superb. So here's a good example here. This figure sort of help, you know, he's helping to balance um, the, the figure of the dead Christ. Look at how he's like point, like he's, he's on his tiptoes. And it's just an unusual pose. And again, it's not normal. And someone who would be helping to remove a dead body um, probably would not be in this pose. Um, so that's one of the stylistic conventions of manners, painting these sort of unusual poses. Um, oops. Um, let's see. So, and, and he's always dancer-like, um, this figure here. And, and this is a style of painting that is not about depicting nature and being anatomically correct as um, it was in the High Renaissance. Instead, mannerism becomes a style of painting that is trying to do something never done before. And, and so they're trying to, you know, they're trying to do something imaginative and, and trying, again, to sort of set themselves apart from these um, great high Renaissance painters, you know, because they had sort of achieved the ultimate goal. And so they're trying to sort of figure out a way, um, you know, to, you know, I mean, what do you do? I mean, so usually we go back to exaggeration um, when we've mastered this ability to imitate nature. And that's usually a cycle that we see happening with art history. Another feature of mannerism is that it depicts beautiful, graceful figures. Um, it has a moving sort of emotional tension um, portrayed throughout um, figures. And, and figures also often have this sort of mask like quality to their faces and they, they sort of look similar so when you look at these figures I mean there's definitely this sort of emotion um, and grief but it also is sort of a mask as well and then again the figures are very graceful and lyrical there's a sense of movement and, and motion and here again you get a sense of the mask like faces um, Um, Patormo's um, undulating mannerist um, contortions that the figures um, are posed in have been interpre interpreted as intending to express apocalyptic and uncontrolled spasms of melancholy. Um, the virgin, larger than her counterpart, swoons sideways, um, inviting the support of those behind her. The swoon of the Virgin was a controversial moment at the time. Um, the swoon of the Virgin in Italian, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it's in your lecture notes. Um, this is also referred to as the fainting Virgin Mary. It was an idea that was developed in the late Middle Ages based on mentions in later texts of this sort of apocry apocryphal gospel, the Octa Pilata, Pilati. A-C-T-A-P-I-L-A-T-I, -A -A -I. so this was some sort of um, writing, which described the Virgin swooning during the Passion of Christ. Um, it, was a, it was popular in late, late medieval art, 
art and theological literature, but as it was not mentioned in, um, you know, the sort of canonical, the canonical gospels, you know, of, of Luke and um, Mark and, you know, the, the main gospels, you know, in the New Testament that we're used to, uh, it became a very controversial sort of depiction um, and from the 16th century, um, it was discouraged by many um, senior churchmen. So this was sort of um, kind of scandalous for him to portray this swooning virgin. So when we look at the composition of the whole, um, the really the painting really does suggest a world of, of sort of these of dancing of this kind of dance. Um, dancing figures and that are grief stricken. Um, the figures inhabit a very flattened space, um, comprising a sculptural um, congregation of brightly um, colors, these sort of pastel colors that I talked about before. And then there, the vortex of the composition droops down towards the limp body of Jesus, off-centered in the left. Um, those lowering Christ appear to demand our help in sustaining both the weight of his body and the burden of sin Christ took on. So again, this, one, that's, this is sort of also symbolic and their grief. Um, no cross is visible. The natural world itself also appears to have nearly vanished. Instead, we see a lonely cloud and a shattered patch of ground with a crumpled sheet um, pro provided um, a crumpled sheet on the ground. And if the sky and earth um, have lost color, the mourners have not. Um, they have these very bright swaths of pink and blue um, and, and that sort of envelop and um, the lip Christ. So here, you know, it really is an unusual color palette and, and it does sort of kind of seem to swirl, you know, this sort of vortex they were mentioning kind of swirl into this sort of off-centered um, positioning of the Christ figure here. And mannerism is actually one of my favorite um, styles of, of Renaissance painting. I actually prefer it um, to the high Renaissance painters. I just think it's very unusual and beautiful and lyrical. Um, this is another Bannerist work. Um, this is done by Parma Giannio, um, and this is called the Madonna with the Long Neck, and you might have actually seen it. It's actually, this is one of my favorite ones. It's very graceful. Um, and so here we see another painting depicting the Virgin Mary. She's seated on a high pedestal, and she's depicted in these very luxurious ro robes holding a rather large baby Jesus. So when we look at um, her, remember I talked about that um, anatomically correct proportions that we saw with the high Renaissance art, um, um, aren't, you know, it's not a goal for mannerist and um, late um, Renaissance painters. And so we see here that um, the Virgin has a huge lap, and then she has this really huge baby um, that's very strange looking. Um, there are six angels crowded together on Madonna's right that are there to adore the uh, oops that are there to adore the Christ Child. Um, the Madonna is very long, um, elongated. Um, she has a very serpentine figure, that sort of S figure. Um, and then also note the repeated use of ovals in the faces. So all the faces sort of have these very oval shapes. Um, a rational space is depicted. Um, so you see this sort of tiny figure of a prophet in the right lower side. And it really doesn't make sense spatially. Um, so there's this, you know, there's this, they're not interested in depicting depth in like in terms of one point perspective or even atmospheric perspective and trying to imitate nature. It's really a sort of irrational kind of almost surreal space. Um, and there's definitely a lack of spe um, um, spatial relationships between the foreground and the background. Um, and again, what that basically means is that everything seems very compressed and there's really not a lot of sense of depth. You also have this column here. That's just sort of in the background. It's not really supporting anything. Um, it's, it's just very unusual. And so mannerist artists were not, con you know, concerned with depicting illusionistic space. 
Note the unusual arrangement of figures. Um, instead of distributing um, his figures in equal pairs on both sides of the Madonna, which we've seen in the past, he crams this sort of crowd of angels into this narrow corner on the left, um, on this narrow co corner, and on the left side, um, there's a sort of wide um, open space um, to to show this figure of the prophet, who again is is you know not not scaled and um, you know is 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 too small, um, and. Um, anyway, um, so there can be no doubt that there's this sort of madness to his method, um, that, you know, it's not that these artists didn't understand the work of Michelangelo and Raphael or didn't understand one point perspective and atmospheric perspective. They knew how to paint, um, correct proportions, anatomically correct proportions. They knew how to achieve depth. Um, they just wanted to be unorthodox, um, and they... And, you know, they wanted to show that the classical solution of perfect harmony, um, which we had seen represented with, obviously, with um, Greek and Roman art, and then the sort of revival in the Renaissance, um, that that wasn't the only solution in terms of art. Um, and that wasn't the only sort of conceivable way of painting or, or sculpting or any sort of art form. Um, Parmigiano and all the artists of his time um, were deliberately trying to create something new and unexpected, even at the expense of this idea of natural beauty that had been established by these great masters. And so they really were considered perhaps one of the first very modern artists because they were sort of, you know, pushing away these ideas of their um, mentors. And, and sort of try to go off on their own and, and discover a new tangent in, in terms of um, in terms of art and visual art and representation. Sorry, I should have been I should have had this slide on when I was talking about. But here's some details of the little tiny prophet. And then also note too that the Virgin is just way too big for the architecture that's um, depicted in the background. I mean, she's huge and. You know, she would actually, if this were a real column and this idea of um, linear space and atmospheric perspective, we would um, definitely, she'd be much smaller. So let's look at some details. Um, we'll take a look at this um, very unusual baby. The Christ baby is very elongated and strange looking and again has that um, serpentine um, sort of curve or S-like shape to it. And he almost looks dead. Um, and, and some art historians think that this is evoking um, a recollection of the Pieta. Remember we looked at Michelangelo's version. This is where um, the Virgin is holding um, the adult um, Christ after he um, has been crucified on the cross. cross. And so some historians think that um, the artist is collapsing these two events together. And so this is a very conceptual idea. Um, and so choices that um, these artists make are always deliberate and always assume a reason for everything in, in terms of when we're looking at mannerist art that, again, it's not that they didn't understand how to do something or he didn't know how to paint a baby correctly, but there's a, you know, there's a purpose um, in the way um, these depictions are made, even, you know, as crazy as they look. Here's another um, detail, and you really get a sense of how long her neck is. It's extremely long and very swan-like. And again, this is not anatomically correct, and, and her neck would not be able to support um, the weight of her head if it were really like this. Also look at her fingers. Um, again, they're very elongated and very unnatural looking. Um, when we look at the detail of her garments, they're very sleek and very silky in the way um, the artist has depicted them, and they almost seem to cling to her body. And so there's that sort of sensuality and eroticism that we spoke about earlier in terms of one of the characteristics related to mannerist style. Um, when we're looking at the composition as a whole, again, note the compression um, of space of the figures to the right of the crowd of these you know this grouping of crowded angels and then note how one angel over here is is wearing a very short um, sort of erotic garment 
and, and really kind of being very suggestive, um, showing off that bare leg. Um, again, we talked about this, the oval faces. Um, and also this, you know, again, like sort of cramming figures um, and, and even cutting figures off um, on the sides um, was very unusual. So mannerist painting is really about style. It's all about style and not imitating nature. And it's, it's art referencing art. So this is, again, another very modern concept. And you probably heard this. So instead of art um, representing life or art, um, you know, representing reality, it's art referencing art. And, and so this is a huge shift um, and, a, and a huge sort of breakthrough in, in art history. So um, here you can compare um, Parmigiano's um, Madonna with the long neck to Raphael. Hopefully you remember this image, um, the Cowper Madonna. And, and you, know, you know, you can really see um, the stylistic differences between high Renaissance and this late Renaissance or mannerist um, style. Um, so take a moment and sort of um, compare and contrast those. I'm not going to do it for you. <laughs> I'm going to move on because we're running out of time. Um, but, but really try to get those um, movements. Um, try not to get them confused. And I've noticed that some people are doing that on their quizzes. You really need to be able to stylistically differentiate high Renaissance, Venetian style, which we talked about in our last segment, and then mannerist style. And I do have a chart on your overview that um, sort of breaks it down. Um, but really try to, um, you know, really um, look at this and see if you can um, stylistically um, show the differences between these two because they're very different. And then also you might want to think about comparing and contrasting to um, Leonardo da Vinci's um, Virgin, his depiction of the Virgin. All right, so this is one of the last works we're going to be talking about. This is actually one of my favorite ones. This is Bronzino. Um, this is called Allegory with Venus and Cupid. Um, it dates from the mid 1540s. Um, and this was a picture that was sent to the King, King Francis um, of France, um, in which we see a nude Venus. Um, with her son Cupid, remember her son Cupid, and they're kissing. And on one side, pleasure and play with. Oh, oh these are um, metaphors: um, pleasure and play um, with other loves. On the other, there's fraud and jealousy that are sort of depicted, and uh, other passions of love that are represented. So. Um, it's these different um, metaphors for love that we see being depicted. And again, this kind of crazy um, depiction of, of Venus. Um, Venus holds a golden apple. She won in the Judgment of Paris. While Cupid sports the characteristic wings and quiver that you're probably familiar with. Um, and again, you know, he, he's sort of like a little baby um, Cupid. Um, and this is probably the more familiar depiction that you're used to. And both figures are nude. Um, they illuminate in this sort of radiant white light. So again, note the very um, light, um, white sort of tonal detail of their skin. And Cupid almost seems to be sort of fond fondling his mother's bare breasts and kisses her lips. So again, this is very erotic um, and very sensual. And this is a characteristic of mannerist style. And, and again, some of these meanings are very ambiguous. So a lot of these interpretations I'm giving you, again, um, they're not quite sure. Um, we see an old man with wings and an hourglass um, next to him that might represent time. And the identity of the other figures and the meaning of the picture sort of remain um, uncertain. Um, so there's a lot happening and going on, um, but we'll look at some details and see if we can figure it out. So the colors are inspired by Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Um, the composition consists of multiple pleasing points of view with the figures, and again, in these very elaborate poses, just like we saw with um, the deposition that we looked at earlier, and also these serpentine S-like figures. Um, the figure of Venus can be likened to a precious object 
Um, she almost looks like a marble statue in a luxurious setting. Um, she is desirable because of her una unavailability, is, is one um, interpretation. Um, the themes of the painting appear to be about lust, deceit, and jealousy as well. And at times, it's also been called a triumph, uh, it has been called the triumph of Venus. Again, it's meaning how it remains elusive. Cupid, along with his mother, Venus, and the nude Puto over here to um, the right, um, are all posed in a typical mannerist um, figure. Again, that sort of um, serpentine um, figure, um, S like curve. And also, you know, the note of the compressed space, everything, there's really not a foreground, midground, or background. And again, everything's sort of crammed together. The Venus is off, um, is really off positioned and not centered. Um, oops. And, and these are things that we spoke about um, earlier. And hopefully you can recognize um, in, Bronz in Bronzino's um, painting. So remember how I said um, artists will reference other artists? And we talked about, this is a, a detail of um, Michelangelo's Pieta. Remember that arm? And we talked about how crazy realistic and, and talked about the veins and the muscularity of the arm. And you can see that um, in terms of the arm here on Father Time, um, Bronzino really is making a direct reference to Michelangelo's arm from the Pieta. Um, uh, he, the Father Time, sweeps, sweeps his arm forcefully out to his right. And again, it's difficult to interpret his gesture with any certainty. Um, it could be to prevent the figures at the far left of the picture from shielding, um, from shielding the incestuous trans transgression of Venus and her adolescent son, Cupid, um, with this billowing sort of fabric um, that almost provides a screen between the figures in the foreground and background. Um, many scholars believe that his gesture seems to say time is fleeting and you never know when it may all be over. And and so these are there's some things going on in here that um, a courtly audience during this time would have probably picked up on that maybe, you know, from our time period we don't quite understand. Um, mannerist arts were inspired really a lot by looking at great artists like Michelangelo. Um, so here we see a depiction from the Sistine Chapel of Michelangelo's um, a, a depiction of Adam and Eve, um, the temptation. And, you know, I talked about this before, and it's not that they did not like these artists, Michelangelo and, you know, Raphael, but they wanted to, to strive beyond them. And so they admired these artists, but they also wanted to take um, their own work um, a step further. Um, some other symbolism we might try to point out, this little boy over here scattering roses and um, is and also stepping on a thorn um, could be, uh, you know, this idea of a jest or folly or this, you know, these ideas of pleasure. Um, also look at this sort of weird creature here behind the little boy. It's a hybrid creature with a face of a girl. Again, she might represent pleasure and fraud. Note how her left arms, her left arm and right arm are switched. They kind of look distorted. And the bottom portion of her figure turns into a reptile um, like figure. And then she extends um, a honeycomb with her left hand attached to her right. Um, and again, this is all deliberate, um, and, and we're not exactly sure what this means, um, but, but definitely, um, you know, it's intentional and, and there is some sort of symbol, symbolism behind it, and clearly not lacking any imagination. Um, this detail over here of this figure on the left has, um, variously been interpreted as jealous, jealousy, despair, and also the effects of syphilis, um, which was a sexually transmitted disease that affected the brain. Um, it was untreatable during this time. It basically would eat little holes in your brain and drive you nuts. Um, and so I don't know if there's some sort of didactic message here or some sort of morality message here. Again, it's very unclear. Um, again, looking at the whole composition, um, you know, 
there's a lot going on. The figure in the top left corner um, might represent fraud and oblivion. And also note the mask-like features of um, the faces and, and sort of this mask motif that's been sort of carried down over here um, to the bottom right corner with the actual depiction of two masks. So do you see that here, the sort of mask and then a mask over here? Um, the erotic um, subject matter of this painting was well suited to the taste of King Francis I of France. Um, remember, um, French and probably the French court during this time, you know, it was very racy. Um, and they they were very much um, into their sort of sexual pro procli proclivities. <laughs> um, and it was probably sent to him as a gift from Cosimo um, de' Mici, who was the ruler of Florence, by whom Bronzino was employed as a court painter. Bronzino was also an accomplished poet, um, and this picture, picture might reflect his interest in conventional um, Petrarchan um, love lyrics, as well as... Um, other sort of poetic genres of the time. And so, again, this painting would be really meant for a, a very educated audience, a very well-read audience who would have been familiar um, with the writings of Patriarch and, um, you know, and, and so, anyway. But this is one of my favorite paintings. I know I haven't done a great, great, great job explaining it, um, just because of it, it's unusual. So that concludes um, my segment on manners paintings. Um, I again, you really the only one you have to know for the AP exam is the first one I talked about. Um, but I, I think you definitely need to look at other examples um, of manners painting than just one to really understand the style and the sort of characteristics of. Um, this late Renaissance style of painting. So that's why I didn't tell you to the end so that you'd listen. Um, but I will post um, this PowerPoint along with my lecture notes. Um, also, please watch any of the videos related to the Khan Academy that are usually located in your resource folder along um, in, this, in the same subunit folder. All right, thanks for your attention.